the attack on the USS Cole in 2000 and the foiled bombings against American jetliners have all been linked to Al-Qaeda forces in Yemen. The United States has responded with drone strikes across Yemen and has sent millions of dollars of aid and military equipment. Joining us now is Dr. Charles Schmitz, an expert on Yemen from Towson University in Baltimore, Maryland. We're also joined by Harun Ullah, a U.S. diplomat who specializes in the Middle East and is the author of the book, Vying for Allah's Vote. He is with the State Department here in Washington. Gentlemen, thanks to both of you for joining us. Charles, as we just heard from our previous guests there, Yemen is facing uh, threats on three fronts, from the Houthi rebels, the Southern Secessionist Movement, and Al-Qaeda. How serious a threat uh, do these insurgencies pose to Yemen? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we have to think a little bit about how we define a threat. In other words, Al-Qaeda um, is, uh, it causes a lot of problems in Yemen. Uh, it's it's uh, very adept at uh, kind of, uh, you know, hit and run tactics. They seem to be well financed and, and, and well led. Um, they, they're not a threat to overthrowing the state, though, in Yemen. And uh, they really haven't been that great of a threat to uh, Saudi Arabia or the United States. I mean, they had the two uh, failed attacks on the airliners, which were, uh, didn't, didn't work. They had a couple of attacks on Saudi Arabia, one of which got close to the, uh, the, the interior minister. But uh, the real threat is sort of disrupting the Yemeni uh, uh, state's ability to uh, implement its development plans. Uh, that's, that's their biggest damage. That's where they really are a very big threat. The Houthis in the north are a different kind of threat. Uh, the Houthis are a partner, in, a political partner, in the national dialogue and in the writing of the new constitution. They are within the political process, yet uh, they, um, they, they, they also are an armed group. Um, and they uh, were threatened for a long time, particularly by the Aslaq party, uh, and uh, the Saudis are very afraid of them as well. Uh, the Saudis and the Americans sometimes see them as an Iranian uh, arm inside of, of Yemen. The southern movement, the third uh, right. in the south, um, they are perhaps one of the more difficult because uh, they have very legitimate and, and uh, widely supported uh, demands in the south. Uh, but they have no united uh, political organization that can speak for them. And the, the, there's been a, quite a bit of turmoil within the yeah, South. Yeah, but as our guest, our previous guest pointed out, the government is engaged in a conversation with them, is negotiating with them. Yeah, but that the problem is the them, mm -hmm. because there is no real them. There are many thems, right. and they're competing. And so whereas the Houthi you can negotiate with, they have a unified command and control, yeah. there's no such thing in the South. So one group may say that, you know, we're negotiating with the president, but then the other groups r refuse it. Uh, and there's no one that can really speak yet, yeah. as yet for the South. That's the problem. Okay. Harun, the government has proposed uh, a ceasefire, yet another one. There was a ceasefire in place uh, in, in June. Uh, that didn't work. Is there any reason to believe that a new ceasefire will work? That's a great question, Anand. I mean, I think, you know, as, as Dr. Mitchell pointed out, that, you know, the Al-Qaeda element there, the Arabian Peninsula, continues to sort of, you know, as fuel this instability. Just this morning, as you saw, they mm -hmm. attacked an airport in Siyun a few hours ago. That's right. And, you know, one of the things that we find in the research uh, on Yemen and sort of the region is that the violence there is, is strategic. There's a reason why they attacked that airport. There's a reason why in Hadhrat Mouth that you saw some violence. Um, if you actually map the political geography into where the violence is happening, it's happening in specific areas for specific reasons. And it's sort of a signaling mechanism. And I think that's a big thing to remember about Al-Qaeda is that that you know they're able their ability to form the networks and to sort of join with other uh, militants on the ground is critical. I think the other factor too that you saw this morning with the airport attack is that you see that al-Qaeda is actually recruiting now from the thin middle class in Yemen, which you haven't seen before. Oftentimes people thought 30% unemployment, poverty drives militancy, but you're starting to see a new trend where they're actually recruiting from this thin middle class. And I think both of those trends are worrying, not just for Yemen, but stability for the region. And Charles, when you look at that kind of recruitment, and as you've pointed out, Groups like Al-Qaeda, groups like the secessionists may prevent development in the country. Does that pose the ultimate threat to the government, the fact that you won't have development, the middle class will disappear, and more people will be recruited? Uh, yeah, that's a very big threat. Uh, the economic situation has deteriorated since 2011. 
Um, some of it has to do with the security situation, the inability to provide electricity and to supply uh, uh, fuel, cooking fuel and, and transportation fuel. Um, but uh, the, the country has a high population growth rate. Um, they they uh, ha have a very young population, a population that uh, who's, who's now the labor force is growing very rapidly. Um, and those people uh, are looking for a future. And right now, the, there's not one for them in, in Yemen. There, there's no real prospect for, as long as the, the political and economic stability, or political and the, and the security situations are not solved, the, the economic situation is difficult to, to work on. I mean, it's always a low priority they, they, for the government. Let's look at how the United States is handling this. President Obama uh, is citing Yemen as a very good example of how the United States should conduct security policy, especially in the Middle East. He, let's listen to what he said recently. Uh, you look at a country like Yemen, uh, a, a, a very impoverished country, uh, and one that has its own uh, sectarian uh, or ethnic divisions, There's, we do have a committed partner in President Hadi and his government. And we have been able to uh, help to develop their capacities without uh, putting large numbers of U.S. troops on the ground. At the same time as we've got enough CT or counterterrorism capabilities that we're able to uh, go after folks that might try to hit our embassy or might be trying to export terrorism uh, into Europe uh, or the United States. Harun, when we look at all the problems that Yemen is facing, economic problems, uh, political problems, security problems, uh, is the president right there that this is a good example for us to emulate? I think the president is absolutely right in the sense that we have in Yemen been able to work closely with the government um, to develop capacity there, to build their capacity, to fight against these militants that are creating the instability that Dr. Schmitz pointed out that, and that are really tied to the economic problems. And I think to put it in perspective, if you look at, for example, our ability to cooperate with Yemen on this as compared to other countries uh, on the war on extremism and terror, like Pakistan, we haven't been able oftentimes to build that same capacity in other places. So when I think you point out Yemen with all the issues and all the internal difficulties, I think President Hadi has really sort of been brave and gone on a limb with the government to try to build a capacity. And as, but I, as this is an endemic issue though. So, the, you know, the extremism is not going to go away tomorrow. You have oftentimes recruitment going up, uh, latent recruitment going up. And so this is going to be a mid to long term issue. And I, so I think the president's right in saying this is an example we can follow in terms of government, government cooperation and in terms of military and civilian aid. Right, Charles, do you agree? Is this an example that the U.S. can replicate in other places? I mean, the, the bar seems to be set very low here as far as security pol policy is concerned. I mean, uh, the bar seems to be, uh, hey, if we get the, guy, the local guy to cooperate with us, that's good enough for us. Uh, well, that the local guy cooperates and that it's somewhat effective, but I think the the efficacy of the of the policies need to be thought about. I mean, uh, the the United States concentrates on counterterrorism uh, that involves uh, running drones, uh, surveillance, and drones. It also involves uh, training of Yemeni special forces. Uh, there are uh, there's a large degree, and there's uh, aid, military aid, but but the military aid goes specifically for sort of surveillance and counterterrorism training, not for general uh, military. Um, and so the idea is you build Yemeni capacities to go after the terrorism. I mean, certainly Al Qaeda is the enemy of the enemy state, and most Yemenis feel that Al Qaeda is the enemy as well, in the sense that they are, you know, mostly killing people and causing security problems, and and certainly not helping the economic situation at all. Uh, you know, when, when Al Qaeda did take over territory and control, the people voted with their feet. There was a huge refugee problem that was caused by Al Qaeda holding territory. On the other hand, the drone problem, uh, the drone issue is very controversial. Uh, the new constitution bans the drones. Uh, the, the parliament has called on the government, uh, the government uh, to, to stop the drones inside of Yemen. Um, in the, the drones are felt to not be effective. Uh, certainly, they haven't damaged Al Qaeda's leadership. Uh, the core leadership seems to retain its capacities, um, and uh, too often, uh, though you know, it's it's uh, the, it, in the uh, it's publicized when there are mistakes made, uh, when wedding parties are hit, right? Um, and the question of the legality and the and the the targeting, who who is making the decisions about who should be killed? And there's been quite a bit of questions about that in Yemen, because in Yemen, there's the feeling that uh, Washington is afraid of Islam. 
And if you, you know, have a have a, a, a mushadda, you have a headdress and a beard, you're a target. And so there's a question on Yemeni's part: is is uh, you know who who makes these decisions, and uh, you know why is it the United States doesn't do it and and the, and the Yemenis don't do it? The right. other thing that we should be looking at yeah. there is the the aid. Um, the United States uh, sends mostly military aid. It's been matched with. Uh, with uh, economic aid, but yeah. the United States is not the major uh, 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 player in economic aid. The Saudis are and the Gulf are. I mean, our, our, our economic aid is minuscule compared to what the Saudis do. Okay. Uh, Harun, I just want to get back to the use of drones. In fact, there was a report in, uh, released Thursday, uh, a bipartisan panel here in the United States mm -hmm. uh, was looking at the use of drones, and uh, it came to the conclusion that after more than a decade, um, of the era of armed drones, the American government has yet to carry out a thorough analysis of whether the costs of routine secret killing operations outweigh the benefits. Have drone strikes worked in Yemen? I think that if you look at the cooperation in counterterrorism operations, the goal of the counterterrorism operations, I think as the president laid out, is criminalizing the insurgency. So the goal is to actually reduce recruitment, because in Yemen, when you reduce recruitment, uh, when you're able to reduce the popularity of al-Qaeda, you see recruitment numbers going down. And so this government-to-government -government cooperation is aimed at sort of building capacities yeah, for the Yemeni Charles governor. But as pointed out, in many of these strikes, mm -hmm. uh, it's been indiscriminate, wedding parties mm -hmm. being hit. Mm -hmm. That increases recruitment, doesn't it? I, I mean, the, the data shows that recruitment, the, the core part of recruitment is identity grievances. It's not the poverty-driving military, at least with al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. And so the goal is not just the military piece of it, which is a counterterrorism operations, but also sort of the media campaigns and the information, because a, a part of this also is this legitimate grievances that Yemenis have. Um, and that's what you see in some of the sectarian dynamics that were laid out earlier. So the goal is what role can the U.S. play in cooperation with the Yemeni government to try to get at this recruitment? It's a difficult issue. It's not a short-term issue. And it requires a lot of international stakeholders. Right. Charles, if we look at the political situation in Yemen right now, there have been protests on the streets in support of the previous president, President mm -hmm. Abdullah Saleh. Mm -hmm. In fact, they want to restore that presidency. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of a threat does that pose to the current transitional government? Uh, Abdullah al Saleh retains a lot of support within the country. Um, he, uh, he, he represents kind of, as he always tried to do, kind of a middle ground between the, a, a socialist leftist uh, threat and an Islamist threat. And he's very good at uh, positioning himself that way. Um, he, he lost the reins of power, so a lot of the patronage that he used to have, he lost. But he still has a lot of wealth, and he still has a lot of followers who don't want to ally themselves with Islam, who are allied with the Muslim Brotherhood and whatnot. Um, and so he sometimes looks like a very good alternative, particularly when people compare the economic situation previous to right. 2011. I mean, the situation has deteriorated significantly. Part of it was his doing. Uh, the government re relied on oil for, for 75 to 80 percent of its revenues, uh, and that oil is running out. And that's the crisis. That's the main crisis that the government is facing right now. They have to raise other revenues. They have to, to raise taxation, domestic taxation within the country. And that, re that requires a different kind of social contract with people that the pre previous president right. never had to do. Okay. Harun, how unstable is the political situation? I think that, you know, it's a, it's a difficult situation, as, as was laid out, with the sectarian issues that you have. Uh, you have potentially international funding of some of the sectarianism in Yemen. You have this endemic um, economic situation. They have, they're running their largest current account deficits mm -hmm. in Yemen at this current time. We saw the previous uh, guest that you had on talk about the sort of real on the ground struggles that everyday Yemenis have. So. With all those issues, um, you know, you find it's hard to build political consensus because people are looking for there's problems to be solved. So when President Hadi come in, now the, the bar is set high. They want those issues to be solved, and when they don't see those issues being solved, whether through patronage and or delivery of government services, they're unhappy. And so I think when you you're going to have this continual churn in the political uh, consensus right. building unless you see real economic conditions change on the ground for everyday people. Okay, gentlemen, that's where we have to leave it. Thanks for joining us.